Uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, symposium on uh, uh, building a more robust India-Korea partnership. Uh, Professor Casewin has already called the house to order, and it is uh, my privilege and pleasure uh, to welcome all of you here to be with us this evening, especially Excellency Shin Bongkil, Ambassador Republic of Korea, uh, Madam Cecilia, I'm not trying to pronounce a Korean name, <laughs> uh, Policy Coordinator, Presidential Committee of the New Southern Policy, uh, Mr. Suresh Reddy, Joint Secretary, Ministry of External Affairs, uh, pleasure having you all and these distinguished uh, guests with me on the dais, Excellencies, uh, members of the media, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I know over the next uh, uh, one and a half hours or two hours, we are going to be discussing a lot about the natural convergence of interests between uh, President Moon's uh, new southern policy and Prime Minister Modi's Act East policy. Uh, there will be a lot of discussions tomorrow also. But uh, to begin with, let me digress. And begin with what I think is the best place to begin with when we talk about uh, relationships between India and South Korea. And that is the best place to begin with is actually the first P in uh, President Moon Jae-in's new southbound policy. And that first P stands for people. People who are the basis, the foundation of the India-Korea partnership. Now, India, you know, is a country which uh, loves its TV soaps. And India is also a country which, which thinks that Bollywood is the best thing which ever happened, is that the soft power of India is immense. And we are very arrogant about it. We are very proud about it. But let me tell you a small story. You know, one and a half years ago, this music channel in India called VH1 launched on Twitter uh, just a program, a little, little uh, segment called Digital Blocks, whereby they started asking people to send in their music requests using hashtags on Twitter. And the immediate response was, you know, they were completely surprised and overwhelmed by the number of requests they started getting for BTS. Now, the channel curators didn't even know who BTS was. So they were all died in the world Bollywood types. Then they started doing research, and then the requests started coming, not just for BTS. Soon, there were demands for EXO, there was demands for EXIT, and they realized that something was started happening. The India was finally getting k pop So, two weeks ago, I think, uh, Excellency Ambassador will tell you more about it. I think you were there, sir. Uh, Delhi also finally played its card right, didn't it? Delhi played its card right. You had card come in. And for the first time, Indian audiences got a taste of real live, a live band performing K-pop. But this is not something actually we should be surprising anybody. You know, uh, Korean serials such as uh, Full House and Huang Jini were being aired in India in 2008. And this was much before Descendants of the Sun ever came into being. And Northeast India's encounter uh, with the Hari wave goes back to the 2000s. A very strong uh, wave that was, and very strong uh, at a time when no other television channels were available. Manipur, Nagaland were completely hooked on to Arirang. They were, they were completely hooked on to uh, KBS world, that is what they were watching. But all this is actually testimony uh, to the amazing cultural power which Korea has always exerted. And that has been the basis of a connect. And that connect was recognized you know, as early as 1920s, even before that. You know, I can go back a long time into history, <coughs> to times of princes. But let me start with 1920, you know, uh, around the time when uh, Rabindranath Tagore, a poet greatly revered in uh, Korea, 
In the 1920s, when Korea was under the thrall of a colonial regime, you know, intent on annihilating, obliterating whatever was Korean culture, at that time, uh, Tagore understood that very soft, quiet, resilient power which this great nation had, and which he described in The Lamp of the East. And he wrote, in the golden age of Asia, Korea was one of its lamp bearers, and that lamp is waiting to be lit again for the illumination of the East. I think, looking at today's world, these are very, very prescient words. They, they presage the way things are turning out. No, this is a world which, barely two years ago, looked as if it had been overtaken by a bunch of blustering alpha males fighting with each other on Twitter. Now, the bluster made the Korean Peninsula look all about uh, missile and nuclear tests. It started, you know, there was only talk about military exercises and threats to give each other the bloody nose that is all we were hearing about. And it was in that situation that we saw South Korea, the Republic of Korea softly, unobtrusively, under the leadership of President Moon Jae-in, take on the mantle of a quiet, understated leadership. It was remarkable, you know, the world stepped back from the brink. We do not know yet what the future holds. We still face an uncertain future. But there can be no doubt that, in the, that at a very, very, very troubled time, President Moon did turn the tide and successfully reestablished the primacy of diplomacy rather than bluster for restoring peace and sanity in those times. So the inherent synergy which we speak about between President Moon's a new southern policy and India's Act East policy is only too obvious. Now, the main focus of India's Act East policy has been to shift the country's trading focus from the West to the Southeast Asian region, towards ASEAN. And the Moon administration's new southern policy focuses on South Korea's development of its relationships with ASEAN and India and Australia and, and this whole region. And while President Moon calls India a central pillar of the ROK's new southern policy, Prime Minister Modi considers South Korea as an indispensable partner in India's Act East policy. And during Prime Minister Modi's uh, first visit to South Korea in 2015, the two sides agreed to upgrade the strategic partnership to a special strategic partnership. And that since then, both sides have been moving to add more substance to their relations across areas uh, diverse as foreign affairs, uh, defense, regional cooperation, security, trade and investment. No, it's, it's becoming a much more diversified relationship than what it was. And with President Moon's coming in, you know, ties have got a real booster dose with the new Southern policy. And the, if you want to read what this new Southern policy is really about, the joint statement signed by the two countries during President Moon Jae-in's visit <clears throat> in uh, July 2018 last year, really provides a roadmap on what the two countries could do together for peace and stability of the common region that has become the focus of our two countries. So let us start looking at the synergies, the very strong synergies in the outlook of the two countries which also found reiteration when the leaders met recently at the G20 summit. So what are these synergies? You know, call it by any name. Uh, you can call it the Asia-Pacific, you can call it the Indo-Pacific. The name does not matter. But the region which is the focus of both of these policy initiatives is today the most important focal point uh, of a lot of dynamics which is shaping the future of this world. And both India and the ROK, the Republic of Korea, see the notion of the Indo-Pacific no, not as an alliance aimed against anybody. I think we are very, very, we have, we, have, we, have very, we have a common ground there. We don't see it as an alliance aimed against anybody. But what we see the area as is a common space shared by all. 
a shared space within which India and Korea, along with like-minded countries, are interested in ensuring an open, balanced, and inclusive architecture for security, for trade, for commerce, and for connecting people. And because of the common desire, the new Southern policy finds deep resonance amongst all the regional nations, you know, dependent on seaborne trade for the economic prosperity, for which they must insist on a common commitment to the need for maintaining you know, freedom of navigation, unimpaired commerce, and so on and so forth. The fact is, yes, we live in a very complicated world. And it's a world far too complex to be defined by Twitter politics and microphone diplomacy. The world has moved far beyond that. And the responses it demands are going to get even more complex, even more nuanced. So they will need to take into account the new geometrix. That's one of my favorite words, the matrix like in the movie matrix. The new geometrix, which is evolving. And with it come a lot of new alignments and partnerships that are going to go with it. And the notion of the Asia-Pacific, the Indo-Pacific, call it what you will, signals this changing geometrix that is at work in this world one that is actually set to alter the geography of power. The power is as exercised in the world today. The one that is redefining the strategic imagination of not just Asia, but of the larger landmass that is the supercontinent of Afro-Asia and of the world itself. And President Moon Jae-in's New Southern Policy and India's own Act East Policy are responses to these changes, the changes, the larger changes which are taking place in the world around us. And the same changes which have caused all this are also seeing the trajectory of our relationship completely alter, change in many ways. First of all, they've influenced uh, the trajectory of our defense ties, the co-production of the K-9 uh, Vajra self propelled howitzer is become one of the very many welcome touch points in our ongoing defense and security collaboration, and that that collaboration is going on increasing. In trade and commerce, you know, we find that the global value chains that fueled Asian growth for the last uh, two decades, today are facing very serious disruption. They're facing disruption because of trade misalignments, they're facing disruption because of technology. Growing trade tensions are forcing the relocation of many industries. And at the same time, you know, developing countries in the ASEAN region and also India itself, which at one time you know, see themselves as the new manufacturing hubs, are constrained by poor infrastructure, poor connectivity, and need rapid upscaling and upskilling of their human resources and human capital. And that is precisely what India's Act East and the NSP need to do going forward. So over the next six, seven years, India hopes to become a $5 trillion economy. And as it grows to that size, that heft, it seeks partners who can play a role in helping develop the infrastructure that will come and shape this growth. This includes not just its ports, its shipping, its roads, but also the digital highways, the connectivity so vital to new commerce and the fourth industrial revolution. And this infrastructure, connectivity, the digital highways are not just the needs of India, they are the needs of the region. And we need to work together on these. And there is a long road ahead. If you start looking at the volume of bilateral trade, it is just reached about 22 billion in 2018. And the two countries have set a target of $50 billion by 2030. Now, therefore, this is not going to happen in auto mode. Both countries will need to work to make that happen so that they can reap the benefit of the comprehensive economic partnership agreements which they have. And effective measures must be taken to augment Korean investment in India, which can buttress uh, Prime Minister Modi's Make in India program. 
to end with, all I'll say is that uh, through this symposium, uh, we hope to get experts who will drill into much of the finer details. <clears throat> and with them, we need to <clears throat> examine the pathways that can enable us to weather this turbulence of trade skirmishes which we're going through at the moment. And the winds, very strong winds of deglobalization, which are sweeping across the world. And start creating our own versions, our own ways of doing things. And find answers to the fact as to how must India and ROK work together to create this network of treaties and alliances, the common understanding of shared norms and values that can become the rules of the road for the larger region and the world.